All right, so our lesson on 10.1, one, we're going to talk about uh, sequences and introduce you to what a series means, and we're going to introduce you to a lot of new notation today. So in your calculator today, you don't have to be in this mode the entire time, but since we're going to have to flip at some point, I would like you guys to put your calculator in what's called sequence mode. So, yes. Okay, so seniors do not have to take this test. However, if they get to the end of when they take their post-test and the grade is not quite where they want it to be, an option is if they've done their homework, they can take this test in order to make magic happen. You're feeling, you got that senior look to you, my darling. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> so would this be the one where, like, if you get it wrong, but, it doesn't count against you? Okay. First, first disclaimer, this is like a whole page of your post-test, this stuff. So when I say, like, you need to know it, like, yeah, because it's like a whole page of your final. So you still need to know it. So let's kill two birds with one stone, seniors. Let's, let's this is your last hurrah. 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 <laughs> So let this be it, okay? Suffer through your homework. It's actually not bad. You might, I'm not going to say enjoy, but in comparison to the other things we've done, you might enjoy it a little more. Um, do the homework. It's not long. If you get to the end and you're like, oh my goodness, I need to pull my grade up, you can try the test. If, this, if there's any test out there in pre-calc that I think you guys could really ace with a little bit of effort, this would be the one. Okay? Juniors and sophomores, you will be taking this test. Unfortunately, it won't be for a long, long time. Because we all are taking our post-test next week. What so, day? should I just be like, every day? Yeah, it's next week already. Because next, okay, so, you guys picked up your review packet, right? That's, I kind of, I'm a little trigger happy with that review packet. I'm concerned about you guys skipping my class for things like ugh, AP test. So I went ahead and gave you your review packet because your post test is happening Tuesday and Thursday next week. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to do that thing where it's like go over a bunch of questions, take part one the next day. Go over a bunch of questions, take part two the next day. Which AP test are you taking? Oh, yeah. We'll figure you out. And yes, and I will tell you in the review, like literally where it splits. Okay, re part one stops at number this. Okay, so I know you guys like that because then you could focus on trig, you know, trig. <laughs> Bad news, guys. Trig's on both days. Both days. Oh, wow, yes, thank you. All right, so you're going to switch to sequential mode. Do you see that hanging out over there next to polar? So you'll notice when you go to y equals, when you're in sequence mode, that looks different. Look at that. Now, some of my newer calculators, you have even something else up top. Don't you have like a sub n versus a sub n plus 1? Okay, so for us, everyone stay in the standard a sub n. If you have options up at the top here, just keep it as a sub n. You can change where you start your sequence. At, instead of the nth term, you can start at the n plus 1 term. Uh, we're not going to mess with that. That's I don't even know why you'd want to mess with that, but I don't know. Not in this class, you don't. So... N min means the starting value for your explicit formula, which typically we'll keep as 1. And then when we have something to program, I will put it in here as the formula. This is where the explicit formula would go. And the only time I really use this is when I have a recursive formula. So remember, the recursive formula is the one where it's like, take the previous term and then add 17. Well, that's they're not really that hard to figure out, the recursive formulas. But what if I ask you something crazy like, What's the 192nd term? Like, I wouldn't want to write down that. And what if I then asked you to sum all of the 192 terms together? That means add them all up. That's not something I want to do by hand at all. So we're going to use our calculator quite a bit today. So for now, um, let's take a look at some vocab. So this is out of your textbook, and it says a sequence is an ordered list of numbers based on a formula. We knew that. We've been working with sequences for the last couple of days. If it is a finite sequence, I tell you where to end it. So, like, give me the first term all the way out to the 50th term. But there are things such as infinite sequences that never end. So, do you think you'd be able to add an infinite sequence together if it goes off to, like, never ending? And the answer is yes. You can in some cases because your sequence will what we call converge. Uh-oh, we got some calc words coming our way today. 
So notation that we have been using, a sub n, represents whatever the nth term is. You'll notice your calculator doesn't use a, it uses u. So u sub n, u sub 1, u sub n minus 1. I don't, I don't know why. I think it's an American thing to use a. You know, America? No, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know why they use a. But your calculator typically uses u. Um, we talked about recursive before where they use the previous term to get to the next term. So this is in your notes finally. And there's going to be a question like this on your test. So it says, here's your explicit formula. And you go, thank you. And then it says, find a sub 6, which is representative of the 6th term. So what do you think you should do? Just plug in a 6. Yeah, do you think you need your calculator sequence mode to do that? No way, man. All right, so 1 over 2 times 6, which is 12, of course, plus 2. And I want an exact answer. So you might need to math enter enter that baby if you're typing. Or you could just think really hard, and I think you get the 25 over 12. It will say on your test to find whatever the weird term is and then give the exact value. Now, that one came out to a truncating decimal that you didn't have to round off, but there's one on your test where it doesn't do that, so be careful. So here it says find the third term of this sequence, and it is one of those funky recursive ones. So we're only going three terms out. I don't feel like we have to use our calculator yet. I think this is one we could do by hand. So the first term is 9. So that's a sub 1. So how do we find the second term? Well, it says right here, this notation is kind of weird. You put a negative sign in front of your previous term. And then you divide it by 3. So if I threw a negative sign in front of 9 and then divided by 3, that would come out to a negative 3. So here's our first term, here's our second term. All right, almost home free. They want our third term. Let's find it. So what would happen if you throw a negative sign in front of your previous term? That would make that a positive 3, and then divided that by 3, and it comes out to a no. The answer is 1. Now that question wasn't too difficult because I only had to go three terms out. But if I had to go to like the 52nd term, that would not have been fun. So in that case, I would have used my calculator. I'll show you a little later how to type a recursive into your calculator. Um, not on this example, though. All right, so your calculator has some old school methods for how to find sequences. I'm going to show you a couple of them, and then um, you're going to decide if you like any of them. And if you do like one over the other, then use that method on your homework. So the first method. And this is the one that I would probably use the most because we're going to use it a lot in an upcoming part of our lesson, is to open up what's called the list key. So second stat, and then go over to where it says ops, and then choose sequence. <clears throat> now, those of us who have an older operating system, so second stat, ops, and then fifth one down is sequence. The older operating system just opens up the sequence prompt and has an open parenthesis and doesn't tell you anything else. Um, is anybody having that experience right now? Camille, does yours have the prompts like mine does? Okay, so what we're about to type in, you have to type it in that order with commas in between. So a little bit of a bummer there. <laughs> um, I, it's nothing that you like have to memorize. I think you'll accidentally memorize it just because of the amount of times we'll have to use it. But if you get, ever get stuck on a test, I don't feel like it's fair to be like, sorry, Camille, you have to remember it and nobody else will. All right, so the um, EXPR is where they want your explicit formula. So the one they were giving us here was the formula 3x plus 2. So because we're in sequence mode, you're going to notice the x is going to show up as an n, but whatever, it's just because of the mode change. So 3n plus 2. And then I, this always cracks me up. It's like, what did you use as your variable? Because some people are weird and don't use the variable key. Well, I'm too lazy for that. So I use the variable key, so I just type my variable again. Where do you want it to start? I don't know. What does the question say? Find the first 10 terms. So we're going to start at term 1, and we're going to end at term 10. You can leave this step blank because it's going to default to counting by 1s, and then it'll paste into the Whoops, it pasted into the formula. Aw, oh, jeepers creepers. No, I was supposed to be in the home screen. All right, try that again. Like I said, stat. 
Pops five. Oh, good, it's still there. And it'll paste it into the formula. So this is on our other calculators. You have to type 3n plus 2, comma n, comma 1, comma 10. And then when you hit enter, looky there. It's your first 10 terms. Now, if you need to see what they are, um, oops. You need to scroll over on them. I forgot how to scroll all of a sudden. Can you guys scroll on yours? This might be a weird thing on mine. Well, it says that 10 right there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Oh, it's 10. I'm so stupid. <laughs> I'm scrolling over and there's nothing. Okay. There is another one? Oh, now I can't count. I'm extra stupid. Okay, cool. Oh, dang. So you guys figured out how to scroll over? Just me? All right, good. Okay. Well, sorry about that. Um, the other option, I don't know if it says it on here. We could store this into a list. Like if for some reason you wanted to do more work with this, I don't know what, but you could store all these data values into like list one using that stow key. But I'll be honest, guys, there's not a question out there where I make you do this. Yeah, that's what I screw up now. Works different. Okay, you're having the same problem I'm having? Just repasted it? Try it. I don't know. I'm all for like... I'm the, I'm the person who just presses the off key on the computer to fix it, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think maybe your calculator has senioritis. Do you think that's what's going on? Right, right. Go through the paste, and then before you get out of it, see if it allows you to scroll over right away. No? Nothing? Oh! See, just a little lazy morning for your calculator, that's all. All right, so she could never get out of it. She's stuck in that list forever. Okay, so that's if you needed to list out a bunch of terms and you're like, yeah, you know what? I don't feel like doing arithmetic 10 times. That would be an easy option for you to fix. Um, the other option is we're in sequence mode right now, but guys, if you were in just regular function mode, we could have just typed in 3x plus 2 and then gone to our table and went, when x equals 1, you get this. When x equals 2, you get that. Like, wouldn't that have been just as simple? Yeah. So, good news is I don't ever ask you on your test, please list out 67 terms. Like, that's not something I'm going to do for you. I might ask you to list out, like, the next term or the next two terms or three terms at the most, but I don't know if you would use your calculator for this particular skill in pre-calc. I'm not saying never, just not in pre-calc. All right, so we could do... That sequence thing, though, in the second uh, stat key that we just hit, we are going to revisit that, buddy, at the end of our lesson. We're going to use that one a lot today, um, just not really for that purpose. All right, so let's talk more about the sequence mode business. It says on your notes there what all of these cool things stand for in that box off to the right side, so you might want to do a little notating or highlighting over here. So the first thing they ask you for is a starting term of 0 or 1, typically in pre-calc. I think all the time, in fact, <laughs> we're starting at, at 1. Um, we will have some applications coming up in the future where I make you start at 0, but we'll discuss why that's that. And then this is where you either put the explicit or you can put a recursive formula. And that's the only reason I would be using this menu right now today is because I have a recursive formula. If I don't have a recursive formula, you probably won't see me in the sequence um, n equals or u equals notation stuff. And then this part, this third part, is the beginning value. But if you're using it for an explicit formula, like we just had one, it would stay blank. So the only time that you would use a beginning value term is if you have a recursive formula. Because remember, they have to tell you where to start. They have to say, like, your first term is 7. Okay. And that's how your calculator is going to do everything. All right, so let's take a look at um, the two questions at the bottom. Oh, there are some notes about Windows, by the way, graphing. Oh, it doesn't really say. It says an appropriate window. That's very helpful. Okay, so we're not graphing anything right now, guys, but when you go to window and you go to set up things that make sense to you, like N, your N should be counting however far out you want them to count. Like if you're starting at term 1 and you're going to term 10, I wouldn't have my N part of my window counting something really crazy and weird. Does it default to anything? I don't even know. I haven't used this menu in forever. So right now it's setting up as 1 to 10. Like, I wouldn't go negative 20 for my first n. That just doesn't make any sense. It's actually not defined for that. 
So um, I would adjust these ends and then just manually adjust the window. There's very few times where you guys are going to want to look at the graph. I'll show you the only time you might want to later on in the lesson. All right, talk about number one there at the bottom. They give you an explicit formula. It's not anything that we've seen. It's, you know, you don't have to worry about, oh, is it arithmetic or geometric today? It doesn't matter. They gave you the formula for whatever the sequence pattern is, and they want you to find the eighth term. So do you think it would be appropriate for me to grab my calculator and try to program a sequence in right now? I think that's overkill, guys. They just want you to find the eighth term. So can we just plug in eight? So eight to the third power minus one over two. That's something. Is it 255.5? Cool. So notice, did not use sequence mode on my calculator for an explicit formula. Not necessary. But what if I do something like this? This is <coughs> recursive. So because it's recursive, this is the only time you'll see me playing around in the sequence mode of my um, graphing screen. So go to your calculator. Go to y equals, which now will change out for a bunch of u sub n's. And let's program some stuff, okay? So remember, the minimum thing here <clears throat> is the starting term of 0 or 1. You guys can just leave it as, um, just don't touch it. Is it defaulting to a 1 for everybody? Okay. But let's program, I have stupid stuff from the last time I screwed up. Okay, let's program this recursive formula. So you're going to type 2, and then you don't have to put a multiplication sign because it defaults to understanding that there's a multiplication there. But how the heck are we going to type u sub n minus 1? Well, you can't do subscripts, but in this mode, your calculator understands that if you put a u followed by a parenthesis, that that is the subscript. So what we're going to do is type a u, which if they literally means the letter U from the alphabet key. I'm sorry, not the alphabet key. It's this guy right here. You see him above the seven? I just like shouted into my microphone. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you see him right above the seven. That was U. And then because it's U sub N minus one, the previous term, you're going to type this key for N because that's the variable minus one. Make sure it's a subtract one, not a negative one. And then there's a plus 5, I think, on the end. Cool. Now, because this is recursive, they want you to tell them where the first part of the sequence starts. Somewhere in this formula, they said a sub 1 equals 7. Okay. So, this time, I would probably like to go to my table. I think you all remember how to get to your table. Now, notice there's... Oh, man... My table is set up from like an old parametric equation thing, isn't it? Table set. I'm going to go ahead and start at 1. When they say table start, it's referring to the n that you're starting with. And I definitely don't want to count by point ones. I want to count by integers. And let's let it autofill. There we go. So, the first term is 7. What do they want? The fourth term. Well, the answer is 91. Now, we could have manually found that pretty quickly. Like, all we had to do was multiply by 2 and add 5 a couple of times. I don't think if that showed up on a test, you guys would have too much trouble doing it manually. But if for some reason in your future, your teacher asks you something horrible, like, what's the 43rd term? You would just scroll down to 43. Okay? <laughs> that wouldn't be horrible if you had it programmed in your calculator. If there's something nasty on your um, homework where you have to go far out and you don't want to do it by hand, by all means, use the sequence mode. All right, guys, flip to the next part of your notes. Some new vocab terms here. Convergent versus divergent. So your sequence, yep, still a sequence. Um, if, they, if your sequence values seem to be approaching a specific value, that's called a convergent sequence. And if it goes off, in some direction or it doesn't actually approach a singular value it's divergent so fans of the movie mean girls no you guys don't watch mean girls i love mean girls remember the limit does not exist no because you don't watch that movie if i is there a generation gap happening right now okay well the limit is a calc concept so if you think about some graphs that we have graphed before can you think of a graph where even though it's going off to infinity in the x direction it still is approaching a value 
an asymptote per se. Uh oh. What's this graph? Um, it could be a few things. Uh, it's a little different because it does go off to infinity, but slowly. But how about exponential decay? Oh, maybe. Yeah. Um, the inverse of a logarithm. Your friend the logarithm, yeah. So exponential decay graphs approach a limit, right? We're going to see some graphs today that almost look like that where they're approaching a limit. We're going to see some weird graphs too. All right, let's take a look at, this guy is from your textbook. The sequence itself is negative 3 times n plus 12. So what I'm asking you is if you started plugging in either really large or really large negative numbers, what would happen to the values of your sequence? Are they approaching a final value? Well, guys, think about plugging in like 10, 100, 1,000. This sequence is just going to keep going off and off and off and off and off towards negative infinity because look at the shape of it. It's never going to flatten out and approach a singular value. So this is what we call a divergent sequence. I personally don't graph these because that's just like more time on my test I don't want to take. So what I do is I think about the numeracy of it. You know, the more large the number I plug in, the more negative the outcome becomes. It's not flattening out to anything. It's not approaching zero. It's not approaching one. It just keeps getting more and more largely negative. So I don't actually take the effort to graph them, but that's because for some reason I really like plugging in numbers, okay? Let's look at this example. Now you probably would have never known what this graph looked like without me showing you, and that's okay. This is a recursive sequence where it says negative one half times the previous term. They also put some weird restrictions. It says that your a has to be uh, greater than or equal to two, and your first term is uh, 36. So look what happens to your outcome values, 36, and then down to negative eight, uh, yeah, negative 18, and then up to negative, uh, positive 9, and then down to negative 4.5. And then it keeps toggling like this, but look what happens as it gets closer and closer to the end of this graph. What's happening? It seems to be like squeezing itself over to the x-axis, and that's called convergent. So it's converging to a value. You don't actually have to know what it's converging to today, just that it is converging. Oh, these are on your graph. On your notes, aren't they? I'm sorry about that. So that was convergent. All right, this one is not on your notes, but take a look at this one because this does trick kids sometimes. So this sequence is very strange. As we plot them, all of a sudden they start going boom, 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 boom. But then they kind of stop moving. They're still going positive one-fourth, negative one-fourth, positive one-fourth, negative one-fourth. This is divergent. And the reason it's divergent is because you never know whether it's going to be at positive or negative. Those are clearly two different numbers, guys. Positive 0.25 and negative 0.25, two very different outcomes. I know they don't seem far apart, but that's all relative, right? So because they're not approaching a singular number, this is not convergent. That's the idea of calculus. We'll learn when the seniors are gone. We're going to do a little mini calc unit. And one of the concepts is when does a limit exist, okay? Geez, seniors, you're going to miss it. You'll see it next year, don't worry. Okay, so this one, um, let's see if you guys can do this without graphing. Think about what would happen to this 64 over 2n if you started plugging in larger and larger and larger numbers. So, like, plug in 100. Like, what's 64 over 200? Just throw a number at me. You can round it, I don't care. Teeny decimal stuff. 0.3 something. All right, then plug in, like, 1,000. What's 64 over 2,000? Start plugging in some really large numbers. Okay, point zero something. Okay, and then plug in like a million, because that's like a big number, right? <laughs> Sixty-four over two million. This has got a bunch of zeros, right? Okay, yeah, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so what's happening to my outcomes as I keep going larger? They're closer and closer and closer to zero, right? They're not going to go down forever, but they are definitely going to try to approach zero. There's an asymptote of sorts. So this is most definitely convergent. Now this one is recursive in notation. So it says take your previous term and then add four. So like the first term starts off with a nine, and then if you add four, you got a 13, and then a 17, and then a 21. And then what's going to happen? You're just going to keep adding four and four and four and four and four. Are you getting to a value that's where it's going to, like, stop? No, it's just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up like a line would. 
So this is divergent. Sometimes I spell that wrong. All right, so let's look at the ones that are on your notes. This one's on your notes. Can you determine what the pattern is? Let's kind of start there. So you're subtracting, looks like we're subtracting some things, right? It's not an arithmetic sequence, so don't get confused with that. It's just some random sequence, but there is a pattern. You're subtracting two, you're subtracting four, you're subtracting six. You're just gonna keep subtracting larger and larger and larger numbers. Are we ever gonna be approaching a value? Uh-uh, it's just gonna keep going negative, negative, negative after a while, so this would be considered divergent. If you wanted to, you would have to try to graph that, but in order to graph it, you'd have to come up with a formula off the top of your head. This formula might be difficult for you guys to come up with. That is kind of a fun thing to do, and you will do that in an upcoming math class probably, but not today, pre-calc. Okay, now here I gave you an explicit formula. So if you're not sure, this would be a good opportunity to graph. Um, why don't we, since this is explicit, let's go ahead to our calculator so we all know how, and let's type this in. Uh, I'm going to have to clear this out. And remember, it's not recursive anymore, so you're going to need to clear out that use of n min because we don't have that if it's not recursive. And I forgot what the formula was. So it's negative 1 to the nth power. Yes, you do need parentheses there. So that way the negative is being raised to the power as well. And then divide by, make sure there's parentheses around the 2n minus 1 denominator. Oh, that's 22. Try again. Um, I'm just going to hit graph and hope for the best. I don't know what my graph looks like. Well, that's... Man, I need some bifocals. Do you guys see the blue dots on yours? Mine are blue. What's happening? Do you see it? If you don't see it, you might want to adjust your window a little bit. My window's really much, much too large in the X and the Y. Well, it's too large in the Y direction. Um, maybe I want to go out further in the ends. I don't know. Start at zero. I'm just making stuff up. I don't know. <laughs> Go to like two. Maybe that helps. Yeah, that didn't help much. Okay, you see the little blue dots? Are they converging to a single value or are they diverging off to infinities? They're converging down to the axes, if you can tell. Yeah, so that's definitely convergent. So in that case, I don't mind you guys using your calculator to graph it. Convergent. <clears throat> But if you guys could tell from your algebraic, like plugging in numbers, that it was going to converge to zero, that's awesome. All right. Let's take a look at a new vocab term. It's called a series. So a series would be when I give you a sequence, but then I want to get fancy, I want you to add all the terms together. So a series is obviously more complicated because there's additional math. Um, we're going to learn some formulas for series coming up in our lesson tomorrow and the next day but I'm going to show you how to do some series calculations on your calculator. Series calculations, not serious, but they are serious things. So. <laughs> All right, so here, this is from your textbook. It gives you a sequence formula, and it says, find the partial sum of the first four terms. That's a really fancy way of saying add up term one, term two, term three, and term four. So they already found them for me, and then... Clearly, you guys can add four numbers together, so you would add them together. That would be the by-hand way of finding a partial sum. Definitely nothing wrong with that, but one thing I want to point out to you guys is that the notation they're using now, because it's a series, it's an addition, a summation, if you will, they use S sub 4 instead of A or instead of U sub N. So, little notational differences. We can have finite and infinite series, so again, you're like, wait, wait, wait. If it's infinite, how do you possibly come up with a singular summation? And the answer is, remember those divergent ones? If they diverge off to where you're essentially just adding nothing, you can find a sum. So that's going to be kind of cool. An infinite sum we'll talk about more tomorrow. Um, this notation, this is called sigma notation. This is a capital sigma. Uh, you guys, when you handwrite it, will just look gross like that. And then it starts with like n equals some sort of number where it starts. Typically, we're going to start at 1. And then the number that's on top of the sigma here is your ending value. So this is your whatever your first term that you want to start at, and then where we want to end the series. Inside of the sigma, 
there should be some sort of a formula. Hopefully it's nice and we don't have to think too hard. If it's recursive, that's a little bit of a bummer, but we'll get over it. All right. Let's take a look at some of these. So this is on your notes. Example four it says, find the seventh partial sum of this pattern. So one, two, three, four, Wah, wah. We have to find five, six, seven. Can you find the pattern? Now, this pattern is not arithmetic or geometric, is it? What are they doing? Like this first jump? Did they add 12? And then they added 11? And then they added 10? So the next one they're going to add 9, so they're going to be at 20. So then they're going to add 8, and they're going to be at 28. Am I doing the right pattern? I used to pride myself on my pattern recognition, but... Okay. And then they're going to add 7, which brings me to 35. So now what we're going to have to do, because there's no formula for us, you will have to manually add these terms together. So please add them up. And through the magic of, I already keyed this. Oh, no, I didn't. Dang it. 63. Cool, cool. So if for some reason I gave you that, and it wasn't any sort of a formula that you could come up with, you would have to manually continue on the pattern and add up all the terms. It's a bit of a bummer. We could have written a formula, but that's probably not worth our time if I'm just adding for seven terms. Let's take a look at um, this next one. It's on your notes right there. So this time, I don't feel like doing any more work. I'd like my calculator to do my work for me because I'm feeling very seniory right now, seniors. Who's ready to n stop doing work? Yeah, me too. Okay, so we are going to make our calculator sum the sequence. So remember that sequence thing we did in the calculator in the list menu? We're going to pull that up, but before we pull that up, we're going to pull up the sum command. So on your notes, could you just write this down for me, and then we'll talk. So the first thing you'd have to do in that sequence thing, our newer calculators will prompt you to do this, so you don't have to memorize it, but, you know, we were talking how some of the older ones don't prompt you. So you have to type the formula in, which is this dude. So it's 2 to the nth power divided by 4. And then it's going to ask you what variable you're using. So you'd be like, well, I'm using an n because that's what my calculator offered me for the variable key. Remember, we're in sequence mode right now. If you happen to be in function mode, this works the exact same way, but you'd be using an X instead of an N. Um, then the pattern, the order says the beginning to the ending term. So they want the first, see this first, to the fourth term. So you do 1, 4. All right, so everybody grab their calculator. Before you pull up sequence, though, you have to pull up sum. The good news is, get to the home screen. I learned my lesson. Okay. <laughs> the good news is the sum feature is in that same menu kind of. So you're going to go to second stat again, but this time you're actually going to go over to math and it's number five. So pull up the sum, stay in there, and then go back to that menu. But this time go over to ops and pull up number five. Wasn't that magical that they're both number five? So math five, ops five. And now this is where my newer calculator will prompt me. If you have an older calculator, you're going to have to just type in what we wrote down on our paper. And I already forgot the formula. What was it? 2 to the nth power. And then divide by 4. Now, keep in mind, people who are using newer calculators here, it's going to do horizontal script. So if you are worried about order of operations and should I use parentheses, it never hurts to use parentheses. So like, if you were like thinking, oh, I think I need to put 2 to the nth power in parentheses, go ahead and do it. You actually don't need them here because exponents would come before a division in an order of operations. But if you're concerned, there are times when we type this, you have to use lots of parentheses. So variable n, I want 1 to what? 4. And then paste it in and let's go. Boom. That was nice. Thanks, calculator. Now, if it said exact answer and you had a weird funky decimal, Hit math, enter, enter at that point. Obviously, that would be 15 halves. Obviously, right? 
Okay, number five. Find the sixth partial sum. Well, I'm very excited to make my calculator do all my work from now on, so let's just do that again. Now, do you remember how your calculator has the ability to pull up previous commands? If you want, you can just pull up the previous command and edit it. I don't really know if that's easier, though, because it's going to overtype a bunch of stuff, and you're going to end up retyping it all in again. So if the only annoying thing is pulling up some sequence, what I usually do, like, for instance, I keyed your, like, multiple versions of your test, do you know how many of these problems I had to do? A lot. So I just kept pulling up the previous entry. Like I'd be like, you know, entry, and then I'd back up and I'd just fix it from here. Now, remember, your calculator overtypes, which sometimes gets me into trouble. So I'm going to type in my sequence, 4n minus 1. Comma in. Now, remember how like I have to get rid of stuff? I'm going to delete this. Delete that. Delete that. There we go. And they want the six partial sum, so one to six. I don't really know if that was faster. Maybe I should have just sucked it up and typed again. And I get 78. Oh, that was nice. Did you not get 78? You got that furrowed brow. 4n <coughs> minus 1, comma n, comma 1, comma 6. All right, so next question, they went ahead and gave me the explicit formula again, so I just need to get that typed into my explicit formula. If you don't like overtyping, then just go grab second list, go over to math to pull up the sum, and then staying in there, go over to ops to pull up sequence. I forgot the formula. Oh, n squared minus 2. And they want, now careful, this time they want from 3 to 7. So starting at 3 and ending at 7. I'm not going to ever have you guys change your step off of an integer of 1, so you can always leave that blank. 125, cool beans. All right, can we talk about how we're going to type in number 7, though? I'm a little concerned about that one. So let's go to our menu. Pull it up again. All right, so you have 3, and then you need to multiply it by the base of 1 half has to be in parentheses, or you have to use a decimal, so 0.5. And then in the exponent position, you have the quantity n minus 2, and I'm pretty sure you have to use parentheses here, but like I said, it doesn't hurt to use parentheses even if you're not totally sure. The problem is if you don't use parentheses here and we needed them, we're going to be in trouble. I'm pretty sure we need them because it's a horizontal script, so we need to indicate that n minus 2 is in a quantity. All right, now remember I messed this up last time. n goes from 1 to 6 this time. And then if you wanted something prettier, a little math enter enter. 189 over 16. That's beautiful. All right, let's take a look at a couple applications before we end here today. So, number nine. We have a vacuum pump and it removes 15% of the air from an inflated air mattress on each stroke of the piston. The air mattress contains 20 liters before the pump starts. So, as far as the formula goes, um, you start with 20, and then if you're removing 15%, think about like exponential growth and decay. What percent are you keeping? Because that's how you have to word the, the formula. 85%. So you can either do 1 minus 0.15, which is how you're going to get 85, or just flat out write 0.85. But I'm going to put a variable up here, like n or x or whatever you want to call it. But we have to be careful what that x means. That x represents like a pump has been made. So if I put a 1 there, that means like you've pushed the pump down and it has removed the first 15% of the air. So you got to be careful on this question. I think some kids get a little confused in Algebra 2 because we make it so, seem so easy, but you got to be really careful about what that variable represents. So write the first three terms of the sequence um, that remains at, after each stroke of the piston. So if you wanted to, 
this might be an important term to you. I know we don't typically talk about a sub 0, but what does it mean for this problem? It means I haven't pushed the piston down yet. So how much should be in your mattress here? It should be 20. Yeah, nothing happened. So zero pumps. But then after the first pump, I don't know, something, 17. And then after the second pump, 14.45. And then third time is 12 point, it's kind of gross, it's like 12.2825. And then if you kept pushing down the piston over and over and over again, essentially what's going to be happening at some point? Think about this in real life, guys. At some point, how much air will be in the mattress? There should be none. It should be converging if you want to use a new vocab term to zero. So oh, I already kind of answered this one. So it's going to converge to zero. It does say to write an explicit formula. So what I would like to do is I'm going to set it up as, instead of a sub 1, we'll say a sub 0 equals 20. And then for our recursive formula, I'm going to say take your previous term. And then multiply it by 0.85. Now, this formula we wrote up here kind of leads me to my next thought. Doesn't that look super uber duper familiar to you? I hope. Please tell me yes. Yes, Mrs. Bruzzo, that is clearly an exponential decay graph with a base of 0.85 and an initial starting value of 20. You're right, kids. All right, so we're going to come back to that concept of how these are really exponential decay graphs when we apply them. Uh, your homework assignment is probably, if you turn the page, did that sweet angel of a woman give you the book page again? She is so nice. I don't know if this is the actual assignment, though. Let me look. Is it? Look at that. All right, so make sure you're reading on the instructions. You're just going to identify the graph. Don't do any extra work there. What a wonderful lady she is. All right, work on that tonight. We're going to do lots and lots more calculator work over the next two days, so make sure you're comfy on this stuff.